Okay, welcome everyone once again. Um, this is our wrap-up session. So I'm Wilma Hodges and I'll be moderating our closing session with our keynote Michael Feldstein. This session will be an open question and answer format with our speaker, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, just because of the, you know, the numbers of folks, it's usually easier to, to take questions um, via text. So if you can type your questions into the questions box, I will read them off to Michael so that he can address them. Um, we, uh, we are recording this session. It will be available later on the Imperio YouTube channel. And um, after uh, we wrap up at 5, um, we're actually going to do the prize drawing right here in this same webinar room. So please stick around for a couple minutes. Um, I'll have a few closing remarks on the day, and then we'll be giving away some stuff. So you want to stick around for that because you do have to be present to win. So, um, so make sure that, uh, that you stick around for the closing. And... Let's see, I won't introduce Michael again since I already introduced him this morning, um, but I will uh, go ahead and, and turn it over to him. And there are no slides, by the way. We just have the keynote uh, Q&A slide up um, just to let you know, um, but we're just going to be taking questions. So, Great. So, well, thank you, Wilma, and uh, thanks again to the Imperio Foundation and to Longsight and to all of you who are dialing in. Uh, or webbing in. I'm not sure what the right verb there is. Just to remind you what the ground rules were that we established yesterday. Um, since uh, I can't see or hear you and you can't see or hear me, uh, you need to imagine that I am incredibly good looking and I am going to imagine that you are all laughing hysterically at all my jokes. Um, and I think that, that pays the way for an outstanding uh, virtual keynote and, and Q&A. Okay. Well, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. I was just going to say, I also want to remind you um, that I encourage you not to limit yourself to questions. Um, please do chime in with some answers or thoughts from the, from the discussion this morning. Thanks. Okay, great. So the first question we have is, how much do you think tool development is driven by teaching demands or teaching styles are driven by tool development? Ah. <laughs> You know, this is a very timely question. Uh, there is just a, a, a piece by a guy named Jonathan Reese um, at uh, Colorado State University. Um, uh, Jonathan, by the way, is uh, I think a very sharp guy and uh, you know worth re reading his blog. Um, and it was very critical of uh, um, of the whole idea of an LMS. Uh, as getting in the way and constraining faculty more than it helps. And he got into a debate um, that, that started because he was responding to a 10-year-old blog post that I had, um, which is it's really in some ways kind of depressing how little has changed in 10 years. But anyway, he got into a debate on Twitter with uh, Brian Whitmer from uh, from Instructure. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I suspect that it is, uh, I suspect it's more faculty adjusting to tools and tools adjusting to faculty. Um, and I suspect it's that way not because of any neglect on the part of tool developers, but uh, on the, because developing software that responds to faculty needs, to user needs, is really, really hard. Um, you know, we, we, we do our best to anticipate uh, what folks need, and um, you know we develop something that meets the needs of the folks we've talked to, and then there are a whole bunch of other folks we haven't talked to uh, who go and try to use the tool for their own ends, and they, they have to uh, adapt to what the tool allows. So um, I don't know, you know, the holy grail really going back to Chuck Severance's question in the previous session, the holy grail is um, making it possible for faculty and students to easily um, develop their own tools so that if you need something, uh, you will build it and you won't have to adjust to what someone else built for you. Um, we're still a fair distance away from that, but we are slowly getting closer to it. Uh, as you know, more students and young faculty learn programming languages, and programming languages get easier, and uh, we get more and more abstraction 
uh, in the code, but uh, it's a it's tough. Okay, um, we have another um, question actually from this morning. Uh, what advances in LMSs do you see uh, facilitating push activities uh, for content to kind of reach students where they are? Yeah, it's um, it's a good question. Um, it it gets us back to to that question of what do you need. Uh, there was an earlier question about what do you need for mobile, and and what you need are a set of APIs. Um, that uh, um, move content uh, to whatever device students happen to be using, and um, and a way of looking at that content, including the way the content itself is formatted, that will fit well in those devices. Um, I mentioned this morning Caliper. Um, you'll hear me talk about it a lot. If I'm talking about LMSs, I think it's a really important development. We're still early days in Caliper, um, but I think it's, um, you know, what it promises to do, again, is to provide a sort of a, you know, an activity stream um, for any kind of learning activity uh, that can be interpretable by any device that gets it. Oh, this is a blog post. I, I know what to do with it. Oh, this is a discussion. Uh, thread. I know what to do with it. Oh, this is a um, a note on a piece of content um, on a specific line in that content. I know what to do with it. Um, here's kind of a philosophical question, also from this morning. What is the future of the textbook? Is it going away, and what do you think will replace it? Well, uh, you know, I, I'd like to think that my entire talk this morning was about the future of the textbook. Um, you know, uh, there are all of these um, um, textbook vendors uh, have their own take on uh, what the future might look like. Um, you know, I, uh, in my last gig, uh, was the program manager for MindTap. Um, which uh, I think is uh, uh, is one really interesting, viable approach that essentially, you know, brings the the sort of learning activities that you might find in an LMS closer to the content. So, for example, if you're reading content and and you want students to discuss it, you can put a discussion thread right there, zero clicks away. Um, and sort of use the content as your organizing principle. Um, you know, McGraw-Hill has these smart books, um, which are very much like textbooks, but they've, you know, they've embedded a lot of adaptive intelligence around them to, you know, quiz you a lot and find out if you understood the passage you just read and if you remember the passage you read the, a week ago. Um, you know, these are all. There's no one answer uh, to to uh, the question, but if you find the common thread in all these different answers, um, the common thread is um, that the future of the textbook is figuring out what students should be doing with that content, whether it's you know memorizing it and answering quiz, being able to answer quiz questions that show they retain the information they read, or discussing it, or something else. Um, I, I think the textbook as its own thing, I hope, it, it will go away. Do you see any trends on uh, data-fying or data-enabling libraries of content into smaller chunks that can be consumed um, by students in, in a multitude of formats? Yeah, so this is also a, a kind of a... Um, Something we've wrestled with for a long time. We've been talking about learning objects and uh, re reusable learning objects and learning object repositories for, gosh, I don't know, 15 years now. Um, and um, it's it's really hard to make perfectly reusable content because of the context thing, you know. 
um, if I have a little bit on uh, on John Locke's use of the word person, which was novel, it was you know the first time someone used the word person as distinct from soul. Um, how I use that um, in a literature class about the rise of individualism in the novel is very different than how I use it in a political philosophy class about rights. Um, and so, um, so libraries, I'm not sure that libraries is the right analogy because we end up thinking about creating a centralized repository of these little learning object chunks. What I do think will happen is that um, a lot more content will be tagged um, wherever it is um, in more fine-grained levels. So this, you know, this part of this page or this video or this animation or this quiz question is related to this topic. Um, and um, you know, textbook publishers are already doing this with their own content. What's missing right now is, um, well, there's a standard around what those um, what those tags should be and how there's a technical standard about how they should be formatted and shared. And then there's a, you know, a content standard about what exactly the tags should be. If we're talking about a, you know, calculus textbook and the the curriculum in a calculus book. Most calculus books are pretty much alike in terms of the content they cover. Um, so creating a, you know, sort of a, call it a digital spine for the textbook, for, uh, for a calculus textbook, should be fairly straightforward. Um, tagging content for um, an introductory composition course, more challenging. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> It's a difficult question to answer. You guys are asking good, tough questions. I'm not sure that I'm getting good answers. But. Well, they had all day to think about it, you know, so they really <laughs> saved up some juicy ones, huh? Um, how does the use of technology impact your relationships with students? Do you find that you know them better, or does technology create a relational barrier? Well, so this is also a really interesting and complicated question. Um, I'm going to... Uh, um, pre-announce something uh, here that has, we haven't publicly announced yet. Um, uh, Phil and I have gotten funding uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to do another e-literary TV series on personalized learning, whatever that means. And in fact, part of the series is to figure out what that means. Um, in the first school we went to as a case study uh, was Middlebury College, which is this wonderful liberal arts, elite liberal arts college in, in the middle of Vermont um, with a student to teacher ratio of eight to one. And um, uh, we were asking them that very question. And at first what we heard was, um, well, you know, we do, we don't use it to, to phrase personalized learning here. All our content, you know, all our, our classes are personal. So, you know, eight students to every professor. Um, we do worry about bringing in technology to depersonalize education. Um, but when I started talking to um, individual faculty members, you know, I talked to one guy uh, who was talking about um, how in his class, um, he tends, to, the way the class is structured uh, is driven by um, the way the school week is structured. I mean, you talk about, you ask the question of what are the LMS um, um, forces us to teach in certain ways. We can easily ask whether the, the structure of our course schedule forces us to teach in certain ways. You know, he's got a lecture lab class. And uh, he observed that most expert thinkers in any topic tend to think from the abstract, from the general rule, and then apply it to a specific concrete situation, lecture, lab. But many students are not expert thinkers. They start from learning specifics, and then they generalize from that. They go from concrete um, uh, to, to abstract. And so for him, he said, look, you know, I have eight students, but I still lecture. 
And I'd much rather give them modules in which they could decide whether they're going to go from concrete to abstract or abstract to concrete. And that, that, that was fascinating. And that's in a, in a class of eight students. You know, when you're talking about a class of 350 students, which nobody thinks is a great idea, but is unfortunately a reality um, in many, many, many schools in the United States, then, then technology absolutely can um, make that situation more personal. Um, and if you're talking about face-to-face -face versus distance learning, I mean, I think it's, there's plenty of data that shows that you can't generalize about whether distance learning classes uh, create more or less sense of personal connection. That you can find some that create a lot more sense, and you can find some that create a lot less sense of, of connection, and you can find some people who do better in distance learning courses than in others. How would you respond to students and their parents, potentially, um, concerns regarding the cost of receiving data, for example, text messages on their phones? Um, not everybody has a, a mobile data plan, uh, so they may actually be incurring service fees for some of that. Yeah, well, it's a real, it's a real challenge, and um, it's a challenge um, for any use of technology. You know, that phrase, digital divide, comes from somewhere. And this is just the latest example of it with, with cellular technology. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, whenever you ask the student to spend money on every, anything, whether it's um, a data plan on their cell phone or a $250 textbook, uh, you have to feel convinced as their teacher that in good conscience, you're, it's worth asking them to spend that money because their education is going to be better. They're going to get better access. They're going to get better quality, whatever it is. Um, and obviously, some students are, are more um, price sensitive than others. You know, Middlebury is a wonderful place, but their annual tuition uh, is probably higher than the total combined cost of every car I've ever owned. Um, those students are not going to be worried about data plans. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you know, single mom, you know, first generation urban student uh, going to a local community college, uh, she's got to worry about her cell phone data plan. But she also has to figure out when she can get to school in the first place in between jobs. And the cell phone data plan may be less expensive than, than buying a computer for home. So, um, so it, you know, the, the, the bottom line answer is um, you have to think as an educator carefully about whether what you're asking them to spend money on is, is appropriate and, and the best solution to, to meet their goals and their needs. Do you foresee the LMS changing in ways that incorporates more avenues for student-generated content? Yeah, I think it already is. Um, this is, um, you know, there are two, this all boils down to roles and permissions, um, frankly, um, which is something that uh, uh, Sakai was innovative in early on, and then I think there's, you know, continuing evolution in LMSs in general. Um, what do you allow students to do? Um, and that's now extended by, you know, standards like LTI, which allow you to plug in um, new capabilities from different applications. Um, I, I do worry that, um, that we're just nibbling around the edges of this problem. That, you know, I think there's some validity to the concern that even though an LMS may allow you to do different things with your students, um, it makes it very easy to reproduce the typical, you know, sort of sage on the stage uh, structure. 
Um, and I'm not sure what to do about that. I mean, the reality is there are a lot of faculty who are comfortable with that. And I, I'm not sure um, what we can do to break them out of that or to get them more excited about generating student, or having students you know, become central content generators. And I'm not sure, you know, there's a design, a set of design problems there. How do you build the application in a way that invites that from students and teachers without requiring it? What do you consider the best approach for supporting staff in using digital technologies? Um, you know, uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at these technologies and hearing from people about how they're using them, but I don't spend my day in the trenches struggling with logins and struggling with uh, um, uh, the, it, whatever issues pop up in the help desk calls. Um, so I suspect there are a lot of folks on the on the line who have better answers to this question than I do. The one thing I will say as a general principle is that um, it's really important to build uh, communities among faculty and students um, so that they can support each other. And it, it becomes not so much a, hey, I got to go down to the help, call up the help desk. but you know, I'm pretty sure this person next to me or this person that I work with um, knows how to solve my problem, and I'm pretty sure they'd be happy to help me. Um, again, um, going back to my visit to Middlebury, um, they have students there who are technology co mentors. And um, that is a role, they, they mentor not only other students, but also faculty. And, and I, I just think that's a wonderful idea. It doesn't replace having a help desk, you still need some sort of, you know, institutional backstop that says, look, if all else fails, call us, we'll be there for you. But I think uh, I think it's important to create a culture in a sense that, uh, hey, we're all in this together. We're all learning uh, how to use these tools together. And, um, uh, you know, there's, there's absolutely no shame in asking your colleague or even your student, hey, how do I do this? Um, this question goes back a little bit to the uh, the student content, uh, student created content idea. Um, I liked the thought that you told us about letting students create content. Do you think we should mark the kind of content we want to receive from them, or should we adapt to the content generated by the tools that they use? Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of doing whatever works. If you see them out. Um, um, if you catch them doing something interesting, then go with it. Um, you know, if you use whatever tools they're using, that does put, make more work for faculty, and it does mean that those tools are not always adapted for, well, well designed for what it is that you want to accomplish. But on the other hand, if that's the only way you can get real authentic contributions from them, then, then that's, uh, that's what you you've got to do. I mean, I had a, an interesting, you know, I keep going back to Middlebury because it's fresh in my mind. Um, there was an interesting exchange between the student and faculty member. A faculty member was talking about um, how, uh, about her class and what she does in the class and all the topics she covers. And um, one of the students said, yeah, I would never write an essay on that. Um, but I would write a blog post on it. And if I, if I wrote a blog post on it before I came to class, I'd be much better prepared to talk about it in class. And I, I just think when you hear a student say something like that, you, you can't not try it. <laughs> You've got to figure out a way to incorporate what they're doing. And, and um, if that means letting them use their own blogs or using letting them use Facebook, um, as long as you're mindful of the privacy issues and the work that you're taking on, um, go for it. How can faculty, students, and institutions manage scarce resources, um, attention, finances, et cetera, 
successfully in a world with so many possibilities, options, tools. You know, there's a million things out there. Yeah, so, so I, I think this is actually a super important question and one that we don't tend to answer well. Um, the best way to do this um, is to, to fight to get some time where the campus community can come together and begin to come to cons some consensus about what it is that they need. Um, and there are all kinds of mechanisms that you can develop to make that as painless as possible, but there's no question that it's an investment. Uh, but the, what you get out of that, an investment in time, uh, you get so many returns on that. You get, first of all, a sense of what's important to a lot of faculty and what's niche, what, what's, you know, maybe important to a few but not to many. You, and you get faculty to persuade each other, hey, you know, I know you're trying to do that with tool X, Y, or Z, but actually I do this other thing over here and it's really great if you just take a look at it. I think you'll find that it meets your needs pretty well and then we don't have to get two of these things. We can get one of them. And, you know, best of all, hey, let me show you how to do that rather than having you call the help desk or struggle along with it by yourself. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the one of the best and worst things about teaching, whether it's at the primary level or the postgraduate level, um, is that you get to go into your classroom as a teacher and close the door. And you do whatever you want in there. And that's very attractive. I mean, it, it, it can be wonderful to kind of go in there with your students, clear away all the distractions, and build your ship in the bottle there with them, create your own world. Um, but we also lose a lot when we do that. And um, one of the things that we lose is the ability to prioritize as a group. Um, and another thing that we lose is the ability to learn from each other. Okay, I have a more technical type question for you. Can you talk a little bit about how Caliper would work with ADL's X API? Um, so again, I'm going to say I'm not the best person to answer that question, but my sense is that um, they're kind of uh, orthogonal to each other. So Caliper is is about data. It's going to um, tell you, okay, here is the content of uh, of a student note, and here is when the, the name of the student and the date that note was taken and the particular spot in the text uh, that was highlighted and linked to that note. Um, you know, ADA requirements are largely about how you present that data to the users. And um, Caliper is, is agnostic to that. Um, so you, you could create, you know, Caliper-based systems that are um, more or less uh, friendly to people with disabilities. Okay. Um, part of the issue of breaking away from the way things are to this new way of looking at education is being able to break down the chain of thinking that the classroom has to look a certain way. Uh, what's your view on breaking that change and changing the ways that we use um, and view education with technology? Yeah, so this is this gets to the same point I was talking about a minute ago, which is um, except for the, a blessed few of us, generally most of us have pretty poor imaginations about most things. We, we tend to imagine what we've already seen. And so um, getting people to see other teaching, making that visible, um, is, is huge. And, and, you know, the variation of teaching styles, just going from one discipline to another, is incredibly eye-opening and can be very inspiring. And so, I, you know, I think, um, I think one thing is just to, to do more teaching out in the open and to share more uh, within your institution and between institutions. Um, and, and another is to try and have conversations that get you take you back to first principles, which is what I tried to do this morning. Um, 
you know, uh, we don't, this is another one of those precious time resource things. We often don't have time to think philosophically about our course designs. Um, you know, we're just trying to get the work done before the semester starts um, as we prepare for three or four or five classes and, you know, deal with our families and our committees and whatever else we have to deal with. Uh, but I think it's it's really worthwhile in the precious time that we do have together as as groups to discuss educational technology to not waste too much time um, going into this tool or that tool or or you know the getting down into the into the the details. You need some of that because you know these are at the end of the day where the rubber meets the road and best practices that, that will help faculty and students have better classes. But you need to balance that by stepping away from the particular tool and the particular situation and say, in general, what are we trying to do here? What, what is the purpose of this content? What is the purpose of this interaction? How are, how, what, is, what is the learning objective that we're trying to get the student to or that the student has chosen for herself? And what are the steps that we need to take to get the student to that point? And then, then you know, these tools are you know, tools are tools. They're they're things that you can use to accomplish a goal. Um, and we become so obsessed with them sometimes that we kind of lose sight of the goal itself. And I and I think we need to clear some time each year uh, to to step back and, and and ask ourselves about questions about those goals. Well, it looks like we're just out of time, um, but there were uh, a few comments that came in that I wanted to read off. They're not really questions, more just um, comments from some of our audience uh, folks. Um, this one's from Terry Golightly. She commented that the monastic scribe became obsolete with the development of the printing press. Um, comment from University of Notre Dame, mapping course learning outcomes to competencies is everything about doing. Of course not. And let's see, I think there was one more that was a, uh, yeah, uh, from Antonio Ramirez Barone. Thanks for mentioning socioeconomic differences among parents and students. Where someone is positioned means a wealth of educational options or a dearth of them. So um, those were just a few that came in. We did have a couple questions that we didn't have time to get to, so I apologize for that. But if you'd like to follow up with me, um, I'd be happy to forward them to Michael after the session, and uh, we'll try to get those answered for you. And once again, thank you so much, Michael, for being with us not once but twice today <laughs> to talk about um, your views on education. Well, thank you. Um, I, I hope this was uh, was fun for all of you. You know, I, I get to listen to myself talk a lot. Uh, so, uh, I, I, you know, I hope that we, we get to carry this on and that I get to, to hear more from all of you in the future. Um, uh, thank you for, for taking the time this morning and this afternoon. Thank you. Um, and I just have a few wrap-up uh, slides. Like I mentioned, um, we are going to do a quick um, prize drawing. So for those of you still hanging with us here at the end of the day, um, this is your reward time, potentially. <laughs> um, but first, I would like to um, just kind of give thanks to a lot of folks who are involved with the conference. Um, I'd love to thank our sponsors. I've got them listed here in, you know, alphabetical order, but um, the Imperial Foundation, Asahi Net International, Blindside Networks, LAMP Consortium, Longsight, and Unicon were all instrumental in making this day possible with their generous uh, donations, um, both in services and in kind. <laughs> so um, we thank you, um, all of our sponsors. And I'd also like to thank uh, the folks who helped out on the planning committee. Um, there were a whole bunch of folks that helped put this event together, so I, my hat goes off to them as well. Um, we did a lot of work over a lot of months to make this happen. This was the first time we've done something like this for the Sakai community, so we're, we're kind of making it up as we go. But all of these folks were involved at some level with the planning, so um, I'd like to say thank you to them. And if anybody was involved and your name didn't make it on this slide, my apologies. We had a lot of people working on this, so I just kind of went back to some of our agendas for meetings and grabbed the folks that were present. 
Um, I'd also like to thank our session moderators for today. We drafted these guys to uh, help with the technical aspects of getting the sessions launched and recorded and um, helping coordinate with speakers and doing little rehearsals ahead of time. So thank you to all of our session moderators. We could not have done this without you. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody here today. We had over 300 attendees from all over the world. We had over 40 co-presenters and presenters. Um, so again, this event would not have happened without the interest and support and collaboration um, from the community. So um, thank you to all of you for attending. And um, I hope that you enjoyed it. Now we do have some prizes. Um, and let me do my little spinning wheel animation. I hope that comes through okay on the, on the webinar. Unfortunately, we don't have $100 million to give away. Um, but we do have da -da, four Amazon gift cards, $50 each, um, that we're giving away. So I'm going to do a little prize drawing here. And I have my, um, my random name picker um, queued up and ready to go. It's not terribly pretty, so I don't know that I'll actually pull it over onto the screen. But um, I'm going to pick a random name here. And we did say that you do have to be present to win. So if I announce a name and that person's not here to, to claim it, um, we'll go ahead and go to the next name. So if you are here, if you could give me a shout out in the question box, just to, you know, let me know, hey, I'm here, I'm accepting my prize. We will be sending them out via email um, after the conference. Um, so, uh, so let me know. Okay, our first name is Chan Kenrick. Uh, from uh, hawaii.edu. Is Chan here? No? Actually, I'll go ahead and pull my not-so-pretty um, random picker over there just in case I mispronounce something. Okay, well, we'll go to the next name then. I'm not seeing anybody claim that one. Let me just double-check in the, the questions. Uh, and make sure that I did not miss it. All right. Scott, are you seeing the question pane? I seem to, it seems to have disappeared for me. I probably moved it to another screen. So, all right. Not seeing anything in the chat box. Okay. Um, do you see the question pane in the control panel? No. no? There we go. Okay. All right. I pulled it back up. Um, all right. Next name, uh, Jolie Tingen. Jolie, are you here? Wow. Okay. <laughs> we knew there'd be a drop off in attendance, but we'll just keep going until we get somebody that's actually uh, in attendance here. Um, this one I did not have an, a name for some of the institutions that did a group registration just sent me the emails. So does this email belong to any of you? WDN5E at Virginia.edu. Nope. Alrighty. Tony DeVore. Tony, are you here? Wow, these people are going to be so upset when they find out that they weren't <laughs> here when their name was drawn. Um, okay, next. Varun Khanna. Varun? Um, let's see. We had a suggestion about loading the current attendees in the random name picker. I'm not sure that I can grab the whole list. Uh, let me see here. Don't know if it'll let me download it while I'm in the session. So, great idea. Um, unfortunately, I think it might take me a little bit longer. Oh, wait. Somebody said that they were here. Was that one of the names that we picked? That doesn't look familiar. All right, uh, Paul Gorman, is Paul here? Nope. 
Laura Foran. Katie Gallus. Katie, yay, we have our first person. All right, so Katie, you just won a $50 Amazon gift card, um, and we will mark that down. So thank you for sticking with us here after 5 p.m. All right, so for card number two, Rob Egan is Rob here. No Rob? Okay. Robert Kelly. Robert. Jeremy Bauer. I'm going to go fast because I don't want to take too much time here. Katie Price. Is Katie in attendance? Cheryl Barnes. Christy DeCarolis, John Ferguson, Thomas Boudreaux, Matt Parson, Just to let you guys know, this list goes on for a ways, so just in case <laughs> you were wondering. Um, Karen McFall, is Karen in the room? Nope. Oh, yay, Karen. Okay, Karen, you're our second winner. So you just won the second card. Congratulations. Okay, Claudia, um, I'm... I'm probably going to mispronounce that, so I'm not going to try to say it. But is Claudia here? Yes, Claudia is here. Excellent. So we have three winners. Um, we're just looking for the last one here. Kevin O'Rourke. No Kevin. Sean Olinger. Orla Mester, she was actually one of our sponsors, so I don't think she would accept it anyway. Um, Greg Doyle. No Greg. All right, how about Olivier Gerby? Francis Wykepobe. Come on, one more. Baylu. Neil is also um, one of the folks who helped plan it, so I don't know that we should actually give it to Neil. Bay Sorry, Lou is Neil. Here. Was he here? Baylu was here. Oh, yep. Baylu is, is here. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so Baylu is our last one. So sorry, Neil. We um, we gave it away just before I, your name came up. So my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the four. So we had um, let's see, Katie Gallus, Karen McFall, um, Claudia M. I'm not going to try to say it, and Baylu. So congratulations to our winners. And I appreciate everybody else sticking through the, the drawing process. Felt a little bit like bingo. Um, okay, so I hope you all enjoyed the conference. Please don't forget to fill out the conference evaluation form. We really welcome your feedback so that we can improve this event for next year. We will be sending the evaluation form out via email, but it will also be a link available in the Sakai conference site. I'm going to go enable that link right now. It's hidden at the moment, um, but you can look there for it as well if you wanted to do it now and get it out of the way. Otherwise, you'll get an email with a reminder to, to fill it out later. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and we really appreciate everybody being here and participating participating and um, hopefully we can do this all again next year. So have a great weekend and thank you all.